So right, dear colleagues, I guess we can we can smoothly start uh, our today's seminar. So it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, our colleague Igor Labanov from Itlo University. And today we will have a second seminar uh, related to skirmions and uh, all associated activities. So the talk is on effect of the demagnetizing field on the stability of topological solitons. Please, Igor, you are welcome. And colleagues, in case if you have any questions, please either raise your hand uh, or you may also ask the question by voice, but please make sure not to interrupt the speaker just in the middle of the sentence. Please, Igor, you're welcome. Thank you for your invitation and for the possibility to make this talk. Uh, the talk will be a continuation of, of the talk uh, that was given by Valerian two weeks ago on the uh, simulation of uh, um, uh, magnetic systems with a focus on topological solitons. Uh, um, so now we will speak about effects of the magnetizing field, uh, which is the most uh, complex part of the simulation of this kind of systems. So first of all, I would like to start with a small motivation. So uh, magnetic storage devices are used for many decades and uh, we all get used to uh, hard drives uh, until uh, solid state devices uh, appear. And uh, this development not uh, finished and uh, up to this moment uh, new devices magnetic devices was proposed for example uh, magnetic strikes memory which was uh, um, invented proposed by Stuart Parkin and this device consists of a track where um, the main wall can move by current and this device doesn't contain any moving parts for that reason, this device can be much faster than uh, ordinary hard drives. Uh, this device can make a 3D, 3D package of uh, uh, wires. And for that reason, density of information can be very high. And uh, development of, of this, this kind of device is uh, very active. and. Hopefully we will see these devices uh, in hardware very soon. Uh, after the uh, invention of this kind of device, for the study, yeah. Maybe, maybe, may I ask a question, sure. a general one. So do I understand correctly that we are like magnetizing these wires and then you have some domains with different values of magnetization? Yes. Yeah, and so, uh, so by, by which mechanism do, do you move this domain wall? Uh, how this works, just in, in general? Okay, there are three uh, main parts of this device. So first is a part that makes writing. So you apply current to, or maybe external field, mm -hmm. to create domain wall. Okay. Another part is reading. So you just sense this uh, magnetization and see if there is a domain wall. And another part uh, is a shift register where, where you can move this domain walls by applying polarized current. Mm -hmm. So essentially this is a shift register. So uh, at the single right hand uh, head, you can create these domain walls then you apply polarized current, then you shift this wall, then you can write another bit of information, creating another domain wall. And after you finish creation of the register, you can read it mm -hmm. anytime you want. Again, shifting this register back and reading the uh, state of the magnetization mm -hmm. at, uh, at the reading head. So what could be the minimal distance between the two domain walls? Let's say several periods of this lattice uh, or it should be larger? It depends on the lattice, uh, on the material, but it can be uh, very, very small in terms of the So it can be, so it can, it, it will be measured in nanometers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. So density can be very, very high. And if we take into account this is a 3D crystal, mm -hmm. so it's not a flat like a ATD uh, layer. So we can obtain very high density of information. Right. Thanks. 
The next improvement in this uh, racetrack memory was uh, um, the creation of uh, topologically protected solitons, which can be used instead of domain walls. So domain walls interact with impurities uh, quite strongly, and that means that you have to apply a large force uh, to move those domain walls, and this can be energy consuming. So it's better to create uh, topological solitons. As example here, we see that we can create skirmion, which encode one, and anti-skirmions, which encode zero. And again, these topological solitons can be moved uh, by applying current, and you obtain essentially the same shift register. But uh, simulation shows that uh, uh, energy consumption here will be a order or maybe two orders of magnitude lower. So is the main point energy consumption or uh, the stability of these, uh, how to say, uh, these skirmions? I would say both, because from a theoretical point of view, skirmions uh, in field theory at least can be uh, uh, absolutely stable. Mm -hmm. So we cannot destroy them. But in magnetic system, uh, they can be destroyed. But uh, if uh, size of uh, this uh, skirmion or density of the lattice is high enough, then barrier for annihilation will be uh, quite large. So the thing is uh, quite stable. But uh, skirmion moves inside the track, so it doesn't interact with the boundary. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, his motion is uh, more. Um, uh, say it's, uh, it, it's more guaranteed that this thing will be moved uh, as you want. It will not uh, depend on the structure of the boundary, on the impurities that sit inside. So skirmion can move uh, around impurity, for example, mm -hmm. and domain wall will have this impurity and you will have to apply additional force to move the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and another thing that we want to detect if something bad happens inside the racetrack. So if we use the main walls to for encoding of the information to encode the bit, we uh, will not understand uh, if the main wall uh, spontaneously annihilated or we uh, have written previously zero at this point. But if we use the additional uh, type of uh, um, solitons to encode zeros on one, then we can detect that uh, something is missing at this point. So essentially we have three states, zero, one, and nothing. And this is beneficial. And since the uh, number of topological solitons is very large, so in principle we can use not only binary encoding, so we can use additional uh, types of solitons for a larger encoding systems, or we can use uh, different solitons to um, make your direction. Mm -hmm. so. All right, very well. so may I ask another, another question, a bit of, a bit provocative maybe. So can you create somehow entangled states of these skirmions to, to enable a kind of quantum computations? Or it's absolutely impossible? Would you comment on that, please? Uh, it is in principle possible, but it's very hard to simulate and analyze. So there are few articles that consider quantum mechanical skirmions, and they are very small, uh, much smaller than these ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it is not clear if it can be implemented in the current stage of development. Mm -hmm. And then another question, how hard is to encode the skirmion? Because when you create the domain wall, I guess you, you, you create some, some stripe of uniform magnetization, but skirmion is more complex object, so you have to do some extra tricks can you comment on that? Uh, you first have to uh, choose correct media. And if the media uh, supports skirmions at uh -huh. all, then you can apply perpendicular current, for example. And this will be enough to create oh. this kind of skirmion. So if you want to control what kind of skirmion you want to obtain, this is different matter. But uh, uh, this is what is, is in, uh, under active development right now. So people try to find new types of skirmions and ways of creation and regulation and control of this type of uh, solitons. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Okay, so this is what's historically the first device, uh, racetrack memory that can use uh, uh, solid tones to encode information. But after that, different types uh, of devices was proposed uh, which can uh, be used to process information. So uh, this is an example of maybe the most famous of devices that uh, uh, implement um, quantum, oh, no, sorry, not quantum, just logical gates. Logical gates, so uh, in this article, we can find all necessary types of logical gates, but here's simply an example of uh, duplication uh, and of uh, annihilation of one of the signals. So it's only part of the devices, but... Uh, but I'm sorry, can I, can I ask a question at this point? Yeah, sure. Mikhail Petrov. So uh, basically, are all these uh, theoretical concepts? Uh, yeah, am, am I right? Or any any real real working devices are suggested? Just, just I'm not I'm not familiar with these references. So there are experimental works that show that these kinds of rest track uh, can be indeed implemented, but uh, there is no functional device uh, at the moment because it's uh, because we have too many things that we have to consider. For example, uh, if we have very uh, narrow track, then interaction with boundary can destroy this skirmion. And if we want to uh, move the skirmion in, uh, in direction along the track, then we have to control direction of the current very carefully, which can be difficult. And to avoid this uh, complication, um, people try to make synthetic skirmion, synthetic anti-ferromagnetic skirmion, which has zero hole uh, angle. And um, we try to find media when skirmions are um, um, it, it, it tends to be moving along the center. Of the of the track, it's not always the case. So we have a lot of uh, question uh, about implementation, and uh, this is the motivation why we want to create uh, this machine machinery for simulation of this kind of devices, exactly to find best way to implement this thing. So most of the works that I cite here and uh, just works on the subject are simulation. But uh, Thank you. so we have an experiment with a basic study of skirmions, but uh, complex devices uh, is a subject for future research. Okay, uh, so this is illustration of what kind of topological solitons we can obtain. So maybe a few words about what is topological soliton. So it's not an uh, ordinary soliton in the sense this is a wave that travel along the middle. So soliton, topological soliton will be a uh, position at single point unless you apply external field or you apply current. Um, but uh, this structure is localized in the sense that uh, support of the structure is quite small maybe a few latest sizes and uh, um, solution in the sense decays exponentially when we move uh, out from this skirmion. So this is a localized structure. So maybe it's better to call local localized structure with a non-trivial chirality, but uh, more common term here is the logical soliton. So on the left, we, we see a, a skirmion, two-dimensional skirmion. And on the right side, we see a couple uh, anti-skirmion and skirmion. And both of them can be used as a information carrier for the devices that was shown previously. But if we uh, work not with uh, approximation, two-dimensional approximation, but with uh, real media, uh, we will uh, see more kinds of skirmions. So for example, uh, at the center of this picture, we see a, a skirmion tube, which is uh, located inside uh, fingerprint pattern. 
And this is not only thing, kind of schemas that we can obtain. So, for example, uh, help fund is possible. Okay, Ingrid, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What was shown on the previous slide? I think you need uh, what, some what comments is, are, are needed. Okay. So, uh, what is the state of the magnetic sample here? Is uh, a three dimensional uh, uh, vector field where each uh, vector points in the direction of magnetization. But uh, it is hard to uh, demonstrate this kind of 3D vector field. Uh, and we decided uh, to show only essential part of the information. So this surface is a, a position of all vectors uh, which belongs, which lie in the plane uh, x, y. So here we see oh, okay. only, only vectors uh, such that Z projection is zero. Okay. And color here represents uh, orientation of the vector in the x y plane. But if we have some white spaces, this means uh, there uh, is no magnetization there. Yes, no, no. We have magnetization everywhere. Uh -huh. But this magnetization will uh, be not lying in the x y plane so along the mm -hmm. yeah so all, all so if, if if we make the same thing here on this plot then we will obtain only one circle so i don't see uh, i don't know if, if you can see my uh, point yes we can we can actually okay so uh this surface in two-dimensional case will be simply a, a circle uh corresponding to a spin that um, lies exactly in the plane. Mm -hmm. In 3D case, we obtain all surface. Okay. So, uh, more complex structure um, can have uh, even zero topological charge. So, in most cases, skirmions um, mm, Classified, how to say, so you can you can understand if you obtain skirmion or something non-trivial, if you obtain non-zero topological charge, yes. But in three D cases, even more complex uh, structure can be obtained. For copion, for example, you will obtain zero topological charge, but non-zero copion charge. And uh, we see, we can see this uh, by examining a uh, picture on the right. Picture on the right shows the uh, uh, position of vectors which point in more or less the same direction. And we see that uh, uh, this picture consists of uh, several circles which uh, are interconnected. And this is exactly characterization of uh, non trivial Hopkins charge. So we have a lot of different candidates uh, for implementation of information carriers. And uh, most of them were computed uh, uh, in numerical simulation. But for example, Hopion uh, has not been uh, demonstrated in experiment yet because it's quite difficult. For example, because mean magnetization for Hopion will be zero. So you Mm -hmm. cannot see this directly. So how, how should we excite uh, our sample in order to get uh, some Hopfion type excitation? Yes, this is the main question. Uh -huh. but, uh, we, we have shown recently, but not published yet, that uh, uh, this Hopfions can be created probably spontaneously by um, heating sample and then cooling. Yeah. I wonder if some gradients of the magnetic field would work for them, or it's, it's also not enough. Yes, but uh, it's hard to say, it's, it's better, better to check. Mm -hmm. So they are stable. We know that even for quite common media, they can be stable, but uh, it's a very complex uh, experimental work to, to demonstrate that they exist for really example. So, so our task here is to uh, understand uh, to to introduce a method how we can numerically uh, check if this uh, kind of uh, 
uh, topological soliton uh, is metastable and how long this uh, structure will live in sample. And um, again, nobody really uh, shown that this uh, hopron exists in uh, magnetic materials, yes? So at the current stage, we have to make simulation just to find uh, types of uh, particles, quasi particles that can uh, live in the media and we'll find the conditions under which this particle will live long enough to be useful for, for computations. So from <clears throat> theoretical point of view, from numerical point of view, this kind of structures is described by Heisenberg type model. And uh, we include uh, Zeeman interaction, anisotropy field, uh, um, asymmetric interaction, and uh, anti-symmetric interaction, relations to more interaction. And uh, uh, these contributions are sufficient to obtain um, uh, topological, non-trivial topological solitons. And uh, simulations show that uh, we can uh, um, obtain the same result as an experiment in most uh, of the cases. So at least qualitatively, we obtain uh, the same picture. So this is a model, we can be said that it is quite accurate. And all the contribution here are local or short range interaction except of the polar interaction which uh, you know that has this kind of form and uh, um, in most simulation so again this is uh, about state of art in simulation of this kind of devices so uh, previous part with uh, short range interaction is quite easy to implement and we have several numerical codes that can do this and uh, using uh, this contribution we even can predict how long the structure will live Pro again problem with prediction of uh, lifetime of the solitons is that uh, uh, oscillation of spin in the model uh, happens uh, in the frequency which is uh, several orders of magnitude higher than transition rate. So uh, this uh, simulation, uh, this dynamics can be simulated directly and we need additional methods. So we, we stated here uh, again all necessary contribution and what we can do further to make dynamics. So dynamics is simply a... Igor, Igor, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. So just just can, can you come back to the slide with the model? This one. The Hamiltonian, right. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it looks like this uh, discrete, uh, discrete model, right? Yeah, this is one. No, it's rather to better say not discrete model, but atomistic model. So if we yeah, yeah, this, that's uh, fair, yeah. So there's not continuous. Uh, uh, next is so there are different terms. So what, which of them exactly mean uh, co exactly correspond to appearance, are responsible for appearance of topological order? So what should I, I take into account? So what is the minimal model to get any topological states? So uh, external field and anisotropy are necessary, but only necessary to make uh, uh, skirmions uh, of fixed size. So unless we obtain these two terms, we cannot uh, uh, guarantee that uh, specific size will correspond to minimum of energy. Uh, what is uh, uh, about jelashinsky mori interaction? If we include jelashinsky mori interaction, then exchange interaction can be quite simple and we can consider only interaction with uh, nearest neighbors. So essentially, uh, topological, uh, uh, topological solitons are created by uh, introduction of uh, Jelashinsky-Mori interaction to the uh, normal Heisenberg model. So let's, take, let's start for the simple Heisenberg model. There will be no any topological uh, states, right? Uh, yes, but if you attend more uh, symmetric exchanges, so not not only interaction with uh, nearest neighbors, but uh, you can include uh, larger sphere of interaction, uh, 
atoms, then you can, in principle, obtain topological solitons. But uh, in this case, uh, um, you will obtain uh, solitons and with the positive and negative topological charge simultaneously in the same media. But if you uh, fix a Dilashinsky Moria vector, then you will obtain only one chirality. And even more, you can uh, remove, I, I will show several uh, slides uh, on the subject, but if you remove Tilashinsky Moria, but you include the polar interaction, you can obtain again skirmions. Maybe it's not very good term for them. Maybe it's better to say this is a, a bite or something like that, bubble, because uh, it will be quite large, but uh, its structure more or less the same as structure of skirmion. So even without an isotropy field? Uh, you need something, at least uh, an isotropy or, or um, external magnetic field to obtain fixed size of the Do you understand correctly mm -hmm. that in order to get non-zero <coughs> constant, uh, you need to break inversion symmetry of the structure, like looks from, from, the, from the equations? Uh, this is common interpretation of this thing, and this is why uh, first uh, skirmions were discovered uh, in the system with uh, broken symmetry. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not really necessary to break the symmetry completely, because uh, if you have, again, many uh, symmetric exchanges, then you can obtain two stable states, one with positive and one is negative topological charge, so mm -hmm. not very defined. Mm -hmm. But with the same energy. With the same energy, mm -hmm. right. OK, the next country. Sorry, there is yeah. a question in chat mm -hmm. from Valadja uh, Shkabokov. What will be changed if you what will be changed if you're taking into account next nearest neighborhood or next next? Uh, this is exactly what I took about uh, several seconds ago. So, uh, if we include uh, arbitrary symmetric exchanges with many atoms, then we can obtain new types of solitons. Uh, but it's not necessary uh, to to make so uh, because uh, in some cases this model, this atomistic model, can be considered as a discretization of the uh, continuous model, micromagnetic model. And in this case, uh, introduction of additional exchanges is just a way to obtain more accurate uh, uh, model for more accurate discretization for micromagnetic model. Mm -hmm. And so another question. So when you simulate some realistic structures, you obviously need some numeric values for these constants. Do people obtain them from DFT simulations or there are some other tricks how they uh, estimate? Both ways possible, so it can be obtained from DFT computation, uh, but uh, most of the time I think they are obtained just from experiments uh, measuring uh, radius of mm -hmm. the skirmion, uh, measuring widths uh, of the uh, domain wall of the skirmion, and for simple models, model at least it is sufficient to, to define all necessary constants. Mm -hmm. So again, you can measure dependence on uh, radius of radius on uh, external magnetic field, for example, and it allows you to uh, match this uh, constant a little more precisely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, this is model. Um, this is Landau-Lisch equation. Uh, in more general case, we should, of course, get torques here, but uh, it's not what we really interested in here. Uh, the expression is quite simple for simulation again, but uh, uh, to find at least one decay of skirmion, we have to wait very, very, very long time, many years probably. Uh, of simulation time because uh, this uh, event is very rare. And for that reason, we uh, use different uh, strategy to compute uh, the transition rate. So we compute minimum energy parse part. 
between uh, two metastable state. For example, here we have uh, skirmion in the beginning, and uh, our final state is ferromagnetic state. And uh, we have several uh, minimum energy passes here for different uh, values of the uh, external field. Yes, as far as I can see. And uh, what is this minimal energy pass? This is a uh, uh, pass in the configuration space uh, such that uh, it is continuous. And uh, we cannot move any point of this pass without increasing its energy. So in a sense, this is uh, the pass such that motion along this pass correspond to the minimum increase of energy. And what we are interested in most is uh, activation barrier. So it's different between maximum along the pass and uh, energy uh, at the beginning or at the end of the pass. Uh, why we are interested in minimum energy pass? Because uh, we assume that, um, yes, we assume that uh, Boltzmann distribution is uh, 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 correct here. So we, we, we take very large periods of time. And so we can assume that uh, our system is uh, in a stable state. And uh, then probability to reach this uh, largest uh, energy point, so transition state, will be simply uh, proportional to the values that we obtain from uh, Boltzmann distribution, as we can see here. Uh, so this is a common approach for transitional states theory. And um, to find main contribution to the Arrhenius law, which exactly describes rate of transition uh, through the transition state, we uh, need to find uh, activation energy. And the next thing that we want to compute is a uh, uh, pre-exponential factor. And this pre-exponential factor depends on the entropy of the states, transitional state and minimum energy state. And this is uh, the most uh, time consuming part of the computations. So minimum energy pass is uh, more or less easier to compute. Uh, we have several techniques, and I don't want really to, to go into details here. But what is about uh, pre-exponential factor? Uh, from Igor, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting you. So probably I missed the the so the, the, the problem by itself. So what is the the problem? Is to find the optimal way how to compute, uh, how to find the skimions or to find their this transient di dynamics. So what's what's the problem you're aiming at? Okay, so uh, we want to find skimions or other topological solitons which are quite stable. So we want that the lifetime of the skirmion will be uh, at least several seconds, better several years. And first thing that we uh, have to start with is the computation of uh, uh, the energy of the state. And we want to show that this uh, state is a minimum of energy. So this is metastable state. But how does it relate to the lifetime? So isn't why can't you? So you have a, you have shown our uh, uh, landau lipschitz equation, right? No, so. it's uh, okay. Uh, there are several things that should be taken into account. So landau lipschitz equation, uh, of course, de uh, defines dynamics locally right. on short periods of time. Yes. But for uh, long periods of time, uh, landau lipschitz equation is not very suitable because dynamics will be very complex and uh, largest part of the dynamics will be simply motion uh, near the minimum. So uh, our first thing uh, is again using Arrhenius um, law, which uh, only take into account that states are distributed according to Boltzmann uh, distribution, and that's all. It's, it's, it's already enough to say that transition rate will be uh, computed by Arrhenius law. So it, it's only taken into account probability to jump from the minimum to transition state. 
But when we want to compute a pre exponential factor, we have to take into account Landau Lishitz equation. Okay, so that, then you say that the only mechanism of, 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 of destruction of skimions is kind of fluctuations. Yes, this is exactly what we consider. So you can destroy skirmion by changing uh, parameters of the system, applying current, applying field, and so on. But in this case, uh, you will probably uh, just uh, um, make this table, uh, make this meta stable not stable anymore, mm -hmm. or you simply decrease lifetime. Uh, significantly, and this uh, schema will be destroyed. Simply so, in, 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 in this picture, so the Landau Lifshitz equation it describes only the appearance like turning on skermions. Is that right? No. So, in, in, in you, this... you analyze, you analyze the energy uh, state. So, yeah, so it's you know, different, different things. Uh, landau lishitz equation here describes dynamics near transition state. So we, we, we say that uh, transition happens uh, in two parts. So first part is we moving uh, to the vicinity of the transition state. And after that, our state have to go through the dividing surface somehow, separating our uh, different states. And uh, um, behavior near this transition state uh, governed by this uh, uh, landau lishitz equation. So in principle, we can obtain uh, a looped trajectories, for example, and then we obtain no transition. Or we, we, we can obtain very, very slow transition. So our particle can, um, our state will move to the uh, dividing surface, but uh, asymptotically, for example, and never reach it, it, it not happens uh, in reality, but rate of the transition will depend strongly on the um, uh, on, on the law of motion. I see, I see. And the schemion is the magnetization is is constant, right? So it doesn't oscillate or something. Uh, how to say we not work with uh, only single skirmion in this model so we consider in a sense an, an ensemble so this is why we have Boltzmann distribution but we do not consider uh, changes in this skirmion so we, we, we assume that all these kinds of skirmion exist simultaneously in a sense mm -hmm. just with different probabilities so, and uh, all the states which has non-zero topological charts from our point of view is a skirmion. Okay, okay, I got it. Oh, okay, then transition rate uh, can be computed as a product of uh, temperature contribution, which is shown from Arrhenius law and a rate constant, which can be uh, computed again, um, considering uh, motion near uh, dividing surface. And it can be shown this uh, contribution will consist from uh, three multipliers. One is a constant multiplier. Another one depends only uh, only motion itself. So the second multiplier is essentially velocity uh, of the state near the transition state. And the last multiplier is a um, ratio of uh, partition function, in fact, in the minimum and in the saddle point. Um, okay, I, I see that I have to focus <laughs> I should focus more on the basic things here, but uh, maybe maybe it's better to plan another seminar to to show no, the we, details we, because because I we discussed this to... by the way in the presentation by Valerian Messier, so uh, maybe we can focus on more specific things. But we will be asking some questions afterwards, and you have yeah, sure. no, no problems. Mm -hmm. 
So, anyway. uh, so okay, so I can, I can recall simply. So th this term is obtained by integrating velocity of state over the dividing surface. Yes, so we have, uh, so, so we already uh, take, taken into account probability to reach dividing surface from Arrhenius law. And now we are interested in uh, what time is necessary to go through this uh, dividing surface mean time. To compute this mean time, we integrate our all the dividing surface, compute uh, according to landau lichard equation, velocity of the state, and assume additionally that uh, uh, energy can be approximated using harmonic approximation. So maybe I have, it's here, yeah. So we uh, assume this harmonic approximation. If this is true, then uh, all values in the landau lichard uh, equation can be explicitly written in terms of the eigenvalues of the Hessian, and this integral can be taken, and the result of the integration will be exactly this, this equation. Another way to obtain more or less the same equation uh, is uh, a Langer theory, uh, which uh, results in the same, more or less the same expression, except of the second term. And this second term will be not uh, mean velocity near the dividing surface, but uh, uh, main contribution to the transition from all trajectories uh, near the saddle point. So we take a, a, linear, a linearized equation of motion, landau lichard equation near the saddle point. And uh, since we consider only uh, saddle points with smallest energy, this will be a first order saddle points, we will obtain only one trajectory which correspond to uh, motion through the dividing surface. All other tra trajectories will be uh, looped uh, in, inside this uh, uh, dividing surface. And um, to find velocity of uh, uh, states going through these trajectories, we have to compute only single positive eigenvalue for this linearized equation of motion. So we have more or less the same. And uh, when we do simulation, we see that these dynamical factors, second term here and second term here, they are more or less the same, and they are generally something like uh, 10. So this, the value will be not very small, very large, so it's somewhere near uh, the unity. And that means that uh, uh, from practical point of view, uh, the most time consuming part of the computation and most interesting part of the computation is computation for this ratio. And this ratio essentially is defined by entropy of the states. Um, so this is again integral that we have to compute when we compute pre uh, exponential factor. Uh, it can be expressed explicitly as uh, was uh, shown in the, in the previous formula. But uh, in fact, what we uh, compute here is the partition function. Yes. And if we assume this harmonic approximation and uh, write uh, the result, uh, the, the results and formula, including uh, transition rate, we in fact obtain simply Exponent as an Arrhenius law, but difference of energies will be not uh, difference of energy of the transition state and minimum, but uh, of uh, free energies of the state. Uh, so, what about uh, uh, computation of, of these values? Um, so, my main uh, operator, main value that we want to operate here is the uh, Hessian of energy. And uh, what we see in our expression is uh, uh, lambdas, which are um, eigenvalues of the Hessian. Since uh, in interesting cases, when we have skirmions of size something like micron, uh, latest site will be uh, something like nanometers, we obtain, we, we have to consider simulation domain about thousand by thousand by thousand lattices. And, uh, 
uh, dimensionality of the space will, will be very large and this uh, large uh, matrix even not possible to save anywhere. So uh, what methods uh, exist for computation of uh, transition rate right now? So most commonly used method is uh, computation of the matrix itself, computation of spectral decomposition for uh, this matrix, but it works only for a uh, number of uh, spins, something about uh, 10,000, hardly more. And most uh, publication consider only this kind of stuff because of uh, computational restrictions. But uh, expressions that was stated above can be uh, rewritten in uh, matrix uh, independent form, in a sense, by this independent form. And it can be stated that we want, uh, in fact, compute a dynamic factor as a mean value of Hessian on a specific vector. And this vector can be computed uh, quite uh, fast. So we only need to know uh, tau, which defines normal to the dividing surface. And we uh, need to know transition state itself. Then A express velocity vector uh, near, the, near the transition state. And uh, we want to compute Hessian on this thing. And uh, this can be done in uh, arbitrary basis. For example, it can be done in the basis of the initial spin. And that means that um, this computation uh, costs the same value uh, the same time as the computation of energy itself. Another thing is the uh, computation of the entropy refactor, which is a uh, ratio of determinant of Hessians. So common way to compute Hessia uh, determinant is to obtain spectral decomposition or singular decomposition or sure uh, decomposition, something like that. And all of them uh, result in dense matrices. Uh, and that means that uh, it is not even possible to, to form the matrix itself. So, uh, OK, so as far as I see, details not really uh, interesting here. Yes, so um, I, I will just go through the, the, the method that was uh, published by us. So we introduce uh, coordinates which are related to the uh, three, uh, three D vectors, uh, which are used in the original formulations. Therefore, we avoid uh, complex nonlinear uh, coordinate systems. Uh, we avoid singularities and so on. And uh, we obtain our Hessian in this uh, simplified form. Uh, but we have introduced um, uh, Lagrange multipliers, which allows us to uh, do this for arbitrary configuration, no matter where uh, singularity is. Uh, after that, we uh, can use uh, uh, LU or QR decomposition for this matrix using uh, the fact that uh, if we consider only a short range interaction, then the matrix of Hessian will be sparse and even more, it, it can be uh, of the form of the band matrix or even three diagonal matrix. And uh, this allows us to uh, apply Gaussian transformation, for example, in a very fast way. Uh, so uh, the idea here is again that we can increase uh, speed of computation significantly using structure of the matrix, so using much, sparsity of the matrix. Uh, what is the number of the spins which you can simulate now? Previously 10 to the fourth, but now? Uh, we, we already made some computation for uh, systems with uh, several millions of atoms. Mm -hmm. And in theory, it can be even done for larger systems, but uh, it, it will require additional efforts to make supercomputer ports and so mm -hmm. on. Oh, OK, uh, but it's uh, again possible only because of we use uh, um, uh, local or uh, short range interactions. Uh, this is explicit formulas that can be derived to obtain the uh, diagonalized matrix, <laughs> even for periodic and for arbitrary boundary conditions. So using Woodbury matrix identity. 
we can introduce arbitrary perturbation of our matrix and <coughs> anyway we still can, can be possible extendable <coughs> Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll try to <coughs> continue. <coughs> it still can be possible to compute this determinant uh, using modified matrix, so we can uh, append uh, impurities here, for example, or we can append arbitrary boundary conditions. Oh, I can skip it. But what about our main problem is uh, uh, stray field <coughs> on multiple interactions. So this uh, is uh, computation. Uh, numerical computation for uh, stability domains for skirmions of uh, different sizes, uh, taking into account different adjacent schemory interaction and taking into account stray field. We can see that uh, we have one part of the uh, diagram, uh, green part, uh, which corresponds to small size skirmions, which are stabilized by Zolashinsky Mori interaction. And this is uh, the part that is easier to uh, simulate. And this is the skirmion that studied in details. But uh, <clears throat> if we take into account stray field, then we can obtain skirmion almost everywhere. But size of the skirmion will be much larger. And for some, <clears throat> <clears throat> and for some parameters, we can obtain the stability. So we will obtain skirmions of two sizes. So we can obtain seamlessly uh, nano size skirmion, and we can obtain much larger skirmion. So here we have uh, 100 nanometers, but it can be even larger. So here we have result uh, from experimental work, and uh, on the left we see different. Uh, different types of skirmions that uh, were obtained in a real experiment. And we see that uh, here we work in a micro scale. Yes, so size of the skirmion can be up to one micron. Uh, it's not really desirable probably in the uh, realization in real devices because we want to obtain high density of information. But anyway, if we work with this uh, large uh, skirmion, then we can be quite sure that it will be stable, very stable, so it can live for a very, very long time. Anyway, we see that uh, uh, stray field is important and uh, it can stabilize uh, particles that will be not stable otherwise, taking into account only um, short range interactions. Uh, even more, we can say that not only stability, but even shape of this uh, skirmion can be affected by uh, the polar interaction. Um, in fact, uh, uh, skirmions and uh, anti-skirmions, they are all uh, of circular shape, even if we take, uh, even if uh, we take into account different Reality. So, if we rotate um, uh, the mori vectors, we uh, obtain all the circle uh, anti skirmions and skirmions. But if we take into account uh, the polar interaction, then anti skirmions will be different in shape from skirmions. And as we see uh, on this plot, uh, for larger skirmions, something about micron size, so the difference will be very significant. So anti skirmions will be not be circular anymore. And this is a um, sign that we probably should uh, 
recompute everything for antiskermions because uh, their lifetime, their dynamics will be probably very different from skirmions that uh, consider for for false for small sizes. So, I yeah. wonder, does this shape, uh, is this shape dictated by the symmetry of the lattice? So you consider a rectangular lattice and then you get this square? No, it, it can be if we work with a, a quite small skirmion, yes, and lattice effects are visible. But in this case, no, lattice much smaller than this thing. And what we see is uh, exactly a result of uh, dipolar interaction on the antiskirmion. Right. For skirmion, for skirmions, the uh, shape will be circular. Yeah. yeah, I understand that. But what prevents this antiskirmion to be rotated uh, 45 degrees, let's say? Ah, because it's antiskirmion. Antiskirmion has two different edges. It has uh, internal edges. So antiskirmion, uh -huh. um, right. Okay. Can because there are some uh, pluses and minuses in the lumetization. Yes, so on the right we see antiskirmion and we clearly see two exits. Uh -huh. yeah. Associated with it. <laughs> okay, uh, so what about computation of the um, astray field? Uh, there are a few codes that can compute stray field and then may, can make dynamics with the stray field, but uh, there is no at the moment uh, code that can or method that can compute uh, uh, Hessian for this state uh, partition function and therefore the transition time lifetime for, for this kind of states. So, what do you propose? Sorry, I, I yeah. guess there was a question from Mikhail. Misha, please. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but maybe uh, I, I don't know, maybe I can ask it in, in the very end. So, uh, so it's very general. Uh, no, no, no problem, as you wish. Yeah, let's after, after the finishing. Mm. Sorry, I'm out of time, but I will try to make this thing shorter. So, idea is to reformulate somehow our problem in terms of the stray field of additional degrees of freedom to uh, obtain again a uh, Hessian of new energy, which uh, will be uh, again a sparse matrix, and we can apply our method. And this is possible, but what we should do in this case. So instead of uh, computation of a dipolar interaction, which is essentially integral of uh, all pairs of uh, um, spins in the system, we consider more basic thing. We consider uh, stray field or the magnetizing field. So again, we uh, state uh, Gauss law here. We know magnetization for the system, and we want to compute uh, the magnetizing field here from uh, Gauss law. Uh, we uh, say that uh, this demagnetizing field is generated by effective magnetic charge density, which is stated here. Or, and uh, we say that if we don't have additional free currents, so we can uh, find the potential which will define our uh, magnetic demagnetized field. And uh, this potential will satisfy to Poisson equation. And place one equation is a, a local one, so uh, corresponding matrix will be um, a sparse matrix. Then uh, we can connect again our dipolar interaction with uh, this uh, uh, demagnetizing field, because if we know the potential, we can uh, return back to the uh, magnet magnetic field. And we see that expression for the uh, magnetic field is exactly a field which is generated by dipole, and this dipole in this way is uh, simply a magnetization per, per volume. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we can uh, formulate a new energy functional, now it's in continuous form uh, um, for our system. Uh, this functional is written in continuous form, but uh, uh, everything except of uh, this democratizing field is exactly the same as uh, in the previous statement. So if we make discretization by fine and difference, we will obtain exactly what was written previously. But now we have, we have, we have this additional term. Uh, to make this notation shorter, we can introduce, first of all, additional uh, constants just to make dimensionless values. Uh, and we can uh, 
um, we, we can note that uh, this expression is the quadratic form with respect to n orientation of magnetization and uh, with respect to u potential of the demagnetizing field. So to remove unnecessary details, we rewrite this uh, in this form as a, again, quadratic form. And we have additional constraint here, which uh, allows us to compute a demagnetizing potential. So we have, uh, again, our problem, and additionally, we obtained constraints. If we uh, want to solve problem for metastable state, for example, it's just a, a framework. It can be applied for everything. We can uh, eliminate this constraint and formulate uh, energy in the form stated below. And this form is exactly obtained if we uh, formulate our problem uh, as a problem on computation of dipolar energy, which was stated in the beginning. Yes, it's exactly the same problem. But we have another reformulation using only uh, sparse matrices and uh, additional constraint. So uh, what we need to compute, uh, no, this is uh, again details about uh, introduction of Lagrange multipliers and uh, computation of Hessian in Skipet. Uh, but what we obtain, so we need to uh, compute determinant of the Hessian of energy. And this determinant is the form of sure complement. And uh, that means that we can increase size of our matrix and obtain additional uh, block, uh, which corresponds to this new degrees of freedom or, or corresponding to the magnetizing field. But the determinant of this new matrix, larger matrix, will be uh, the same as uh, previous with the polar interaction, except of uh, this constant multiplier. And this multiplier corresponds to the determinant of Laplacian, which can be computed uh, directly. So it's more or less known. So uh, that means that we reformulated a problem with dense matrices with the polar interaction in terms of uh, problem with sparse matrix. And that means that we can directly apply methods which we developed before for this uh, matrix uh, Hessian with uh, demagnetizing field. But we can do slightly more. So we can uh, introduce new term to the energy, uh, which directly take into account uh, energy of the magnetizing field. So we have seen that uh, just technically we can introduce new degrees of freedom as an auxiliary part of the simulation uh, to compute the determinant in a more fast way. Yes. But we, in principle, can reformulate problem completely and say that uh, we consider not only energy of the system itself, but we also include energy of the uh, demagnetizing field explicitly. And it seems that uh, in this case, we can again formulate a problem on uh, metastable states. We can uh, again compute Hessian and so on. And uh, uh, why we introduce this term? Uh, because uh, this problem on metastable state will be written exactly in the same form that we obtained here with the same Hessian matrix. So this is a direct generalization uh, of this auxiliary degrees of freedom to the formulation of the problem uh, itself. Uh, but now we have different problem. So it seems that if we consider problem uh, taken into account the magnetizing field, then transitions between states can happen not only because of rotation of the magnetization, but also uh, by pertur uh, perturbation of the um, demagnetizing field. So degrees of freedom corresponding to demagnetized field. And uh, it seems that problem and principle can be very different, completely different. So entropy will be different. So barriers probably will be different and so on. But the funny thing here is that it turns out that if we compute stationary point for this problem with uh, larger number of degrees of freedom, uh, this stationary point will be correspond exactly to stationary points of the previous problem without this additional degrees of freedom. And uh, this potential 
magnetic potential that we obtain here will exactly correspond to the demagnetizing field. And another interesting thing is that if we obtain, it's again details about computation of the uh, Hessians in this case, um, energy again can be uh, decoupled to the parts which is uh, constant shift, uh, gradient of energy, and uh, the last part is, is uh, our Hessian is what we want to obtain. But uh, what we notice here is that if we uh, compute determinant of Hessian, then we see that it will be the same as in the previous case up to factor uh, which is uh, determinant of the Laplacian, essentially. But this result can be interpreted in the following way. This, uh, our determinant of Hessian is essentially partition function. And this partition function for more complex system with more degrees of freedom, with more complex transition, will be uh, just product of uh, uh, determinant of the system without additional degrees of freedom, but with the polar interaction, and with determinant corresponding to the uh, demagnetizing field. So problem essentially decouples. And this is what is quite unexpected. So uh, we can say that uh, introducing this uh, demagnetizing field uh, is a good way for compute uh, transitions, first thing. And another thing that uh, if we compute in this formulation transitions that we can explicitly separate processes corresponding to the uh, excitation of the demagnetizing field and excitation to the uh, demagnetizing field. Or station to the of the magnetization itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a uh, work um, in progress. So we have theory that allows us, and I will say this is the first method that allows us directly compute uh, lifetimes for uh, magnetic system with demagnetizing field. Previous work uh, was only for systems of quite small size, uh, and uh, even in these cases, uh, the works was based on the Fourier transform, so it explicitly, implicitly assumes that our system is periodic, and that means that uh, it can be applied only for uh, um, schemion lattices, for example, only for lattices, not for other lattice schemions, yes, uh, and only now we can start working with uh, quite a uh, large system. But uh, again, we, we working on, on, on the details uh, related to discretization uh, and so on. And we expect that soon probably we'll obtain uh, some corrections to the previous known results on the stability of uh, three-dimensional topological structures. Right. Uh, thank you, Gigi. So maybe you can take some questions now. Uh, Misha, please. Yeah, yeah, Maxim. So the first question actually was regarding continuous model, and that's what you're descri described afterwards. So uh, maybe I'm, I, I can just s skip it so, so far. Uh, but the, the, the another question is, like, uh, did I understand right that the schemions do not interact with the with electromagnetic wave, or is it possible? How, how so can we can we somehow switch on and or switch off them or they are stable upon it? Maybe it's very naif question still. Uh, it should in principle interact with the electromagnetic waves, but for skirmion it may be a too complex problem. What we already tried to analyze is a, a way of uh, remagnetized more simple. Uh, structure. For example, we can just uh, rotate spin using uh, external field or external current in an optimal way. Yes, to minimize energy that is required for this kind of rotation. And uh, this is a dynamical problem, so we have to compute this impulse that produces uh, more, more, most effective remagnetization. And part of this problem is essentially a simulation of what happens if we uh, apply varying external field uh, on, the, on the structure. Um, it's quite complex behavior even for single spin. So for several skirmion, for, for skirmion containing 
thousands of spins. Uh, it can be done numerically, but uh, it's a complex problem. So it's a good question. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm done with the question. Thank you. Right, thank you, Misha. Another question uh, regarding the, the last part of your talk. So you mentioned that uh, the bigger the skirman becomes, uh, the greater is uh, its lifetime. So when you get this one million of spins, how much uh, increase in the lifetime do you get? So maybe any preliminary estimates? Uh, we can say that lifetime will be a large uh, from two sources. So our simulation shows that larger skirmion will uh, have a larger energy barriers and great financial factors and one thing. And another thing is that from experimental point of view, uh, larger skirmion will live longer but, soon. but uh, again experiment it's quite hard to estimate so, because again if you if you look to the Arrhenius law we see that lifetime depends uh, exponentially on the barrier and how barrier changes with n significantly so it, it means that lifetime will uh, be increased uh, from i don't know microseconds to age of universe or something like that. Mm -hmm. But there is no simple scaling telling that uh, the greater is n, the larger is energy barrier, and then... Uh, we have some estimation, and Valery shown this uh, this previous seminar, but uh, again, scale is very large, so it can be absolutely unstable for mm -hmm. uh, small size and uh, micron size can be lived for a Okay. So, so we expect that uh, a large terminal will leave more for uh, at least for some uh, external field. Okay, uh, thank you Igor, so much. Uh, interesting talk and uh, really interesting topic. Uh, I do not see other questions from the audience, neither in Zoom nor here. So in the meantime, I would like to announce the next seminar, which will be held uh, in two weeks, 11th of May. So we have a foreign guest from overseas, Romain Flery from uh, Switzerland, EPFL. Uh, who will tell us about non-reciprocal topological photonics after these long holidays. So stay with us. See you next time. Goodbye.